The most important thing that I think I can contribute to a conversation about the future of storytelling is that though it is the future, uh, the focus in that phrase remains story. You can elicit all you want with technology, but eliciting laughter and tears and the sort of like exploration of the deep existential questions of our time, that's story. So when I moved to Hollywood in 2003, in order to pursue a creative ambition, you either needed to be the most stubborn person in the world who sort of refused to accept reality and then ended up being successful, or you were a person who by virtue of birth or education or whatever it is had access to the people who would allow you to have a, a creative career. In retrospect, in the weirdest way, uh, given what I'm doing now, my career makes total sense. You know, I went, to, I went to Harvard for undergrad, sort of an upshot of not having a social life and doing really well academically in high school. I moved to New York, took a job as a management consultant at McKinsey & Company. I was fearless enough to try a number of different careers. The reality is, is that it was really just a matter of um, fail fast and, and fail forward. And it just so happened that all of those careers uh, brought a lens to my experience working in the film industry that resulted in the blacklist and sort of how it's evolved. So I was working for Leonardo DiCaprio's company in 2005. My job was to find great screenplays. You know, most of the scripts that I was reading were not great, which meant that either I was doing a very bad job at my job, which was finding good scripts, or the job was reading bad scripts and passing on them. So I sent an email to 75 of my peers, uh, who I assumed were in the same position that I was, and said, look, send me a list of your 10 favorite unproduced screenplays that you read this year, and in exchange, I'll send you back the combined list. That's what I did, that's what they did, and copy and pasted those votes into a spreadsheet, output it to PowerPoint, slapped a quasi-subversive name on it, and that was, that was the first blacklist. So the blacklist started in 2005 as a sort of annual uh, PDF that circulated via email. It actually went viral the same weekend. Lazy Sunday from Saturday Night Live went viral. I like saying that sort of the role of the blacklist uh, is sort of fundamentally unknowable, but in aggregate it's undeniable. The last list was our 10th year. There have been 987 screenplays on the blacklist. 305 of those have been produced. They have won 43 Oscars from 223 nominations, and that includes three of the last seven Best Pictures. Slumdog Millionaire, Argo, The King's Speech, The Imitation Game, American Sniper, Whiplash. Were you rushing or were you dragging? I, I don't know. The list goes on and on and on. Now, those movies have made just under $25 billion in worldwide box office. We didn't make those movies. I think we have a catalytic effect on these movies getting made by raising their profile. Chris Terrio has said publicly that Ben Affleck found out about Argo from The Blacklist, which is completely surreal to me, if I'm being totally honest. You know, whenever I was asked to be on a panel as The Blacklist guy, the first question that was inevitably asked was, I wrote what I think is a pretty good script. How do I get my script to people who can do something with it? So I partnered uh, with Dino Siamich, and we built what was essentially meant to be a real-time Blacklist. Anyone on Earth can upload their screenplay uh, and pay a small fee, $25 a month, to host their script. And I think what that means is, is that, you know, no matter where you live, no matter who you are, no matter what sort of realities are in your life, if you can write a good screenplay, you will have a shot at having a career as a screenwriter. We do a lot of live events. We host a monthly happy hour in Los Angeles for aspiring screenwriters, and we do uh, live stage script readings uh, quarterly with scripts from the annual list with sort of working actors. And then in April, we launched a podcast of working actors performing the top screenplays from the website. As much as I'm proud of the access that we're providing for access sake, we're interested in providing that access as much for like pure, rude capitalism's sake as anything else. There's a financial uh, you know, bounty to be had uh, from having that diversity, from having that access. There's a reason why almost every time Hollywood makes a good movie about people of color, it overperforms at the box office. <laughs> um, it's because there are a lot of people of color here and around the world that want to see movies that reflect their life. And there are a lot of white people, frankly, that want to see movies about people of color. The more great movies there are, the more likely it is that people are going to watch movies.
Our North Star remains identifying and celebrating great screenwriting and the writers that do it. If you're a 13-year-old kid in Columbus, Georgia now, you can go on Netflix and literally watch the entire history of cinema. And so I'm really excited to see what happens when the generation that came of age in overabundance of the best stuff uh, start making stuff themselves. I think it's going to blow people's minds.